Why are the Gospels not in the right time? Why are they out of time? They're shifted. They should be in the 50s, yet they're writing this stuff under the 30s. What's going on here? Lane Einhorn is going to give you guys visual presentation today, PowerPoint, showing you her research and her presentation deals with her two books, A Shift in Time and The Jesus Mystery. You guys can get it down in the Amazon link, the first link in the description. And Myth Vision Podcast also has a Patreon account now. So if you like what we have and you like what we're bringing to the table, you guys can join and become a Patreon member. Make sure you guys subscribe, like, and share this if you guys like this. Comment down below. Let us know your thoughts of the theory. Lena takes us into a wonderful journey on seeing what these authors did with history. And the time shift hypothesis is quite interesting, if I say so myself. Hello, my name is Lena Einhorn, and this is a presentation of the so-called time shift hypothesis of the historical Jesus, which was previously presented in two books, most recently A Shift in Time from 2016, and before then at a number of Society of Biblical Literature meetings, among them the SPL annual meeting in 2012, where the hypothesis were presented under the title Jesus and the Egyptian Prophet. The following is a slightly modified version of the 2012 lecture. For several hundred years now, biblical scholars have attempted to shed light on the historical person Jesus, if indeed he ever existed as an historical person. The one big limitation facing these studies has been the lack of unequivocal first century testimony of his existence outside of the New Testament texts. The only other first century evidence is a contested paragraph in a book by the Jewish Roman historian Flavius Josephus. A paragraph usually referred to as the Testimonium Flavianum, which by most scholars is considered to be at least partially an interpolation, a later Christian edition to Josephus' original text. This scarcity of contemporaneous testimony has led to the majority view among scholars that Jesus probably existed, but was less significant in his own time than the gospel accounts suggest. A minority view holds that Jesus never existed at all as a historical person, at least not as one single individual. However, in the course of comparing the New Testament narratives with other first century historical sources, primarily the most important of them all, the aforementioned historian Josephus, a series of hitherto neglected parallels were detected. Parallels that all occur with a 15 to 20 year delay in Josephus's texts. In other words, Events described in the New Testament as having occurred in the 30s CE, while absent in Josephus' texts depicting the 30s, instead closely seem to parallel events Josephus places in the late 40s and 50s. Although Flavius Josephus is not an infallible historical source, a consistent 15 to 20 year delay can hardly be ascribed to a consistent chronological error on his part. The question is, rather, if these are true and significant parallels. If they are, they would provide new clues to the identity of the historical Jesus. The timing of events depicted in the New Testament is based entirely on the mentioning of known public figures in the text not least in connection with Jesus' trial and crucifixion. Since other historical sources, primarily Josephus, tell us when Pilate was Roman prefect over Judea, and when Caiaphas was Jewish high priest in Jerusalem, and with the additional parameter 
the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, given for when John the Baptist started preaching, the crucifixion of Jesus must have happened late 20s to mid 30s. The problem is, a number of New Testament accounts do not fit within that time frame. This is the basis for the hypothesis presented here. In the New Testament, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, we read how Jesus' disciples, at some point after the crucifixion of Jesus, are brought to the Jewish council in Jerusalem, presumably to be punished. But then a member of the council, Rabbi Gamliel, says, Fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him, but he was killed. We assume that this statement by Gamliel is made in the 30s, because not only does it follow the crucifixion of Jesus, which according to New Testament chronology happened between 28 and 37, it also precedes Saul's arrival in Damascus, which according to the New Testament happened when Aretas was king of the Nabataeans. And King Aretas died in 40 CE at the latest. Thus, the event at the Jewish council must have happened no later than the 30s. But at the same time, it couldn't have. Because this is what Josephus writes about Theodos. Now it came to pass while Fadus was procurator of Judea, that a certain magician whose name was Theodos persuaded a great part of the people to follow him to the river Jordan, for he told them he was a prophet. However, Fadus did not permit them to make any advantage of his wild attempt but sent a troop of horsemen out against them. They also took Theodos alive and cut off his head and carried it to Jerusalem. The problem when we compare these two statements about Theodos is the following. We know when Fadus was Roman procurator over Judea. He was procurator from 44 to 46 CE. So whereas Josephus says that Theodos died 44 to 46 CE, the Acts of the Apostles says that Theodos had been dead for some time already in the 30s. How is this possible? Adding to this, Acts also misplaces another Jewish rebel, Judas the Galilean, and says he was active after Theodos, when in fact, he was active 30 years before Theodos. These discrepancies are generally noted among scholars and usually ascribed to a mistake in Acts. There are, however, other chronological oddities in the New Testament, most of them rarely addressed. The word robbers, lestai in Greek, is prevalent in the Gospels. Jesus was crucified with two robbers. Barabbas, who evaded crucifixion, was a robber, etc. Now, robbers are prevalent also in the works of Josephus. And in his writings, it is clear who they are. The robbers are Jewish rebels against Rome, but also against the Jewish establishment in Jerusalem. Many of these robbers congregate in the Galilee. So how do we know that robbers means rebels also in the Gospels? Well, since the Gospel of John says that Barabbas was a robber, and the Gospel of Mark says that a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection, it seems highly likely that robbers are rebels also in the Gospels. The problem is, when Josephus mentions robbers or robbery, 
he does so during two distinct periods, from the beginning of Roman occupation until the tax census revolt in 6 CE, and then again after 44, up to and through the Jewish war, which began in 66. Importantly, however, Josephus never once records the presence of robbers during Jesus' times. Indeed, both he and Roman historian Tacitus note this as a period of calm. As Tacitus writes, under Tiberius, all was quiet. The reason violence erupted in 44 was the death of Jewish king Agrippa I and the return to Roman direct rule. In conclusion, not only do robbers appear in Josephus' narratives before year 6 and after 44, this fits with the actual state of relations between Jews and Romans. It is thus difficult to explain how Jesus could be crucified with robbers, rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. The names of several of Jesus' disciples, such as Simon the Zealot, Judas Iscariot, and Simon Bariona, also seem better placed in a different, more rebellious era. Jesus was crucified, as were the robbers surrounding him. So what then does Josephus say about crucifixions in this era? Well, he does mention them on a number of occasions, but significantly he makes no mention of Jewish crucifixions between 4 BCE and 46 CE, except in this disputed testimony of Flavianum. He does, however, mention Jewish crucifixions before and especially after this period. It is important to note, however, that the word crucifixion overall occurs in Josephus' texts much less frequently than the word robbers. Now, Josephus also mentions certain decisive events leading up to the rebellion and eventual war against Rome. One of these is the so-called Galilean-Samaritan War, which occurs from 48 to 52 CE. It is a major event. During the period of the war, Josephus mentions Samaritans 30 times, almost every time related to the conflict. And when he mentions Samaritans at other times that century, it is mostly unrelated to conflicts with Galileans or other Jews. Thus, the Galilean-Samaritan War appears to have been a period of belligerence with a distinct beginning and end, 48 to 52 CE. Interestingly, also the Gospels indicate Jewish Samaritan hostilities, but earlier under Pontius Pilate. Later, in the Acts of the Apostles, Samaritans are mentioned without implications of conflict. Now, this discrepancy between Josephus and the New Testament could, of course, be coincidental, since tensions between Jews and Samaritans were presumably latent. There is, however, one additional element in Josephus' narrative of the Galilean-Samaritan War which warrants attention. This is how he describes the triggering event of the war. It was the custom of the Galileans when they came to the holy city at the festivals to take their journeys through the country of the Samaritans. And at this time, there lay in the road they took a village that was called Guinea, which was situated in the limits of Samaria and the Great Plain, where certain persons thereto belonging fought with the Galileans and killed a great many of them. In response... Jewish robbers 
attacked the Samaritans and set the villages on fire. Compare Josephus' description of the onset of the Galilean-Samaritan War with these lines from the Gospel of Luke. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. These narratives from Josephus and from Luke shared several distinct similarities. Both accounts concern Galileans traveling through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem for the festivals. Both accounts mention that the Galileans are not welcomed by the Samaritans and that this leads to a conflict. Both accounts mention these events occurring in a particular Samaritan village. Both accounts mention fire as a suggested means of punishment on the part of the Galileans. Many have noted the similarities of these accounts, and yet they have not been regarded as depictions of the same event, presumably because they occur 15 to 20 years apart. This very delay, however, seems to exactly fit the pattern in the figure we just saw. Immediately preceding this Galilean-Samaritan war, Josephus writes about another pivotal rebellion-triggering event. It concerns a man named Stephanus, or Stephen. Josephus writes about this event in both his major works. What he describes is an attack. Stephanus, who is a Roman servant, is traveling on a public road about 100 furlongs outside the city of Jerusalem. There, in the middle of the road, he's suddenly assaulted by a mob and robbed belongings. In reaction to the attack, Roman procurator Cumanus sends out soldiers to the neighboring villages, something which sparks a sedition among the Jews. Importantly, this is the only Stephanus mentioned in Josephus' entire works. It is therefore noteworthy that a Stephanus appears also in the New Testament in Acts, but 10 to 20 years earlier. The Stephanus of Acts is an early Christian preacher in Jerusalem who is confronted by traditional Jews. On one occasion, depicted in Acts chapter 7, these traditional Jews, quote, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him, and the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Stephanus is killed, and Saul, who would later be the apostle Paul, is inspired to become a violent persecutor of members of the church. Interestingly thus, both of these accounts center on Stephanus being attacked by a mob. And in both cases, the attack happens on a road outside Jerusalem. There, however, the similarities end. For Josephus Stephanus is a servant of Rome, not a Christian deacon. And those who attack him are Jewish robbers. In fact, It is from this point on that robbers become really frequent in Josephus' works. Thus, both attacks on a man named Stephanus on a road outside Jerusalem constitute significant starting points. In Josephus' narrative, it is the starting point for the violent activity of the Jewish rebels. In Acts, it is the starting point 
for Saul's violent persecution of the early Christians. Josephus mentions only one Stephanus. The Bible mentions only one Stephanus. Yet, they seem like distinct events. If it weren't for the fact that barring testimony of Flavianum, Josephus nowhere describes a Christian movement. And yet, he wrote in the 90s, several decades after the crucifixion of Jesus. Could it be that that which the New Testament describes as the early Christian movement in other sources was depicted as something else? Of course, we cannot know that Josephus and the New Testament speak of the same Stephanus. But with the next example, there are no such doubts. Because when Josephus and the New Testament mention the names of various prominent high priests, procurators, and kings, such as Caiaphas, or Pilate, or Herod Antipas, the two sources obviously refer to the same dignitaries. But here we have another problem. The names of the dignitaries match in the two sources, but their circumstances almost never do. Take high priests Annas and Caiaphas. The Gospels describe them as being high priests together or alternate years, and both are present at the trial of Jesus. Josephus, in contrast, makes no record of these two men sharing office. Judging by him, high priest Annas is deposed in 15 CE and is succeeded by three high priests before Caiaphas takes office, and Annas is not mentioned again. Josephus does, however, name two other high priests apparently holding joint office that century. Jonathan and Ananias, son of Nebedias, from the late 40s. They both seem to perform their duties as high priests in the same period, and Josephus specifically refers to them as Jonathan and Ananias, the high priests. Again, the New Testament narrative appears to better fit with events Josephus places in the late 40s or 50s rather than events he places in 20s or 30s. But this last parallel, the one concerning the high priests, would, if true, seem difficult to ascribe to a mistake because it would entail a change of names. Changing the names of public figures in the gospel texts in order to detect or disguise parallels in the historical sources would be both a simple and a radical intervention. There is nevertheless some consistency with regard to which names would be changed. It is a fact that procurator Felix, as depicted by Josephus, bears stronger similarities to the pilot of the Gospels. Than, nay, oh, I missed one more. Okay. It is a fact that procurator Felix, as depicted by Josephus, bears stronger similarities to the pilot of the Gospels than Pilate himself. We have already noted that it is in the late 40s and 50s, mainly under Felix and not under Pilate, that we, according to Josephus, find robbers, crucifixions, a Galilean-Samaritan conflict, and two co-reigning high priests. And there are other examples of this peculiar time shift. Take a sentence in the Gospel of Luke. There were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. The problem with this sentence is this. Pilate was not the ruler of Galilee or of Galileans. Herod Antipas was. But Felix was 
ruler of Galilee, then a hotbed of messianic rebellious activity. And Josephus writes, as to the number of the robbers whom he caused to be crucified, they were a multitude not to be enumerated. Another example. The Gospels mention a passing feud between Pilate and Herod. Luke writes, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. The Gospels also attribute great influence to Pilate's wife, who seems to be able to talk to him about political matters. No feud and no wife is recorded by Josephus with regard to Pilate, but indeed with regard to Felix, who married the Jewish princess Drusilla, sister of Agrippa II, against the will of the king. Thus, Felix had a prominent wife, and at least for some time, he was at odds with the king. Finally, in describing the trial of Jesus, Luke contains a curious tautology. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod. The sentence is strange. Since Herod Antipas ruled Galilee alone, the words under Herod's jurisdiction seemed totally superfluous. A more logical sentence would have read, when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he was, he sent him off to Herod. With Felix and Herod Agrippa II, however, the sentence makes perfect sense. From the mid-50s, jurisdiction over Galilee was divided between them. Thus, the fact that Jesus is a Galilean would not automatically have put him under Herod's jurisdiction. Thus, there are in the Gospels a number of characteristics and events ascribed to Pilate or his times, which, judging by Josephus, fit better with Felix. Now, perhaps the most obvious chronological inconsistency in the Gospels is the differing time of Jesus' birth provided by the two Gospels, Matthew and Luke. Matthew says that Jesus was born in the time of King Herod. And right after this, says Matthew, the angel of the Lord tells Joseph to rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. We know from the mention of King Herod's successor, Archelaus, that the Herod in question is Herod the Great. Herod the Great died in 4 BCE. So according to Matthew, Jesus must have been born before 4 BCE. But Luke has another birth narrative. He instead states that Jesus was born during the tax census under Quirinius. And this tax census, we know, took place in 6 CE. Matthew and Luke thus present birthdays at least 10 years apart. But this is not the only chronological oddity in Matthew's narrative. There is at least one more. And this pertains to Jesus' return from Egypt. Because right after we are told that Herod dies and Jesus returns still as a child, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. There is no indication of a time gap between these two events. On the contrary, the words in those days, clearly place Jesus' return from Egypt and John the Baptist's preaching in the same era. But how could Jesus be a child 
and John the Baptist start preaching at the same time. They are, according to Luke, the same age. Furthermore, Luke states that John the Baptist's ministry begins in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, more than 20 years after the date he assigns to the birth of Jesus. So the question is, was Jesus really a child when he returned from Egypt? Interestingly, there are two early non-Christian sources which state that Jesus was in Egypt, but that he returned from Egypt as an adult. One of these narratives was written by Greek philosopher Celsus, who wrote his only work, Alethes Logos, as early as 175 CE. This is how church father Origen quotes Celsus. Jesus, having hired himself out as a servant in Egypt, on account of his poverty and having there acquired some miraculous powers, returned to his own country, highly elated on account of them, and by means of these proclaimed himself a god. In another chapter, Celsus gives Jesus' biological father the name Pantera. And in the Jewish Talmud, published some 300 years later, we read that Ben Pantera usually thought to denote Jesus brought magic spells out of Egypt. Interestingly, also in the Gospels, Jesus appears when he is about 30 years old and is at first not recognized in his hometown, Nazareth. Where has he been up till then? Is there a way to reconcile all these inconsistencies? Well, possibly. If the Herod, Herod who died was Herod Agrippa I and not Herod the Great, because then Jesus could have returned from Egypt both when Herod died and when John the Baptist started preaching, assuming that the time shift applies also to John the Baptist. And then Jesus would indeed have returned as an adult, just like Celsus and the Talmud state. The internal inconsistencies in Matthew, with Jesus returning from Egypt as a child, at the same time as John the Baptist starts preaching, could thus perhaps be explained by a retroactive and fairly rudimentary application of the time shift, where minimal alterations to the original text leads to unexplainable inconsistencies. Interestingly, Luke may be written more with a time shift actively in mind. We shall come back to this later. In conclusion, a number of events in the New Testament display significant similarities to episodes described by Josephus, but with a fairly consistent delay of 15 to 20 years. And interestingly, it does not end there. Because if the 30s, according to Josephus, are devoid of strong Jewish messianic leaders, the 50s are not. And the most important one of these Jewish messianic leaders was the man called the Egyptian. Josephus writes the following about this man. There came out of Egypt about this time to Jerusalem one that said he was a prophet and advised the multitude of the common people to go along with him to the Mount of Olives. He said further that he would show them from hence how, at his command, the walls of Jerusalem would fall down. Now when Felix was informed of these things, he ordered his soldiers to take their weapons and came against them with a great number of horsemen and footmen from Jerusalem 
and attacked the Egyptian and the people that were with him. He also slew 400 of them and took 200 alive. But the Egyptian himself escaped out of the fight, but did not appear anymore. If the Egyptian, one of the major messianic leaders of the first century, had been active in the 30s instead of in the 50s, historians would unquestionably have compared him to Jesus. Because the Egyptian is defeated on the Mount of Olives, which is where Jesus was arrested. Both had previously lingered in the wilderness. Both speak of tearing down the walls of Jerusalem. Both had lived in Egypt. Both are described as messianic leaders with a great following. Both are perceived as major threats by the authorities. Aside from chronology, the one thing which clearly distinguishes Jesus and the Egyptian are the circumstances of their defeat. The Egyptian is defeated in a battle. Let us, however, look more closely at the events surrounding Jesus' arrest. Mark 15.7 states that Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection, as if we should know which insurrection Mark is referring to. But no insurrection has been described in the Gospels. The only thing described is how Jesus and his disciples have gone to the Mount of Olives to await his arrest. The conflict seems religious, and it is the Jewish council which arrests him. The only gospel which deviates slightly is John. John 18.12 states that when they arrest Jesus, the officers of the Jews are accompanied by the band and the captain. But who are the band and the captain? It is only when we go to the Greek original of the Gospel of John that we get the full picture. The word for band is spera. The word for captain is chiliarkos. A spera is a Roman cohort with the paper strength of 1,000 soldiers. And chiliarkos means commander of 1,000. If John's account is correct, then what occurred on the Mount of Olives must have been some sort of battle. And remember Jesus' prior instruction to the disciples that the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. Thus, judging by John and Luke, the events bear distinct similarities to those preceding the defeat of the Egyptian. And the location is the same. Josephus does not mention that the Egyptian was crucified. This would seem to distinguish the de Egyptian from Jesus. Interestingly, however, it would not distinguish him from the man named Barabbas or as Matthew calls him, Jesus Barabbas, which in Aramaic means Jesus, son of the father. The Egyptian then vanishes from sight. His name, however, does appear again, but curiously enough in the New Testament more specifically in the Acts of the Apostles, where we read, Then you are not the Egyptian who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 Sikari out into the wilderness. The person the question is directed to is Paul, who 
who has just been recognized in the temple. Postulating that Jesus could be identical to the Egyptian would require us to also assume the radical idea that the events as they occurred have been shifted in the Gospels back in time from the 50s to the 30s. It would, however, offer us a plausible explanation for the paradoxical fact that a person, Jesus, who according to the New Testament arouses such attention in his time and is perceived as such a threat by the authorities, nevertheless appears to be invisible in other contemporary sources. The additional fact that the better general concordance between the gospel texts and those of Josephus would be achieved by such a time shift is cause enough to consider this possibility. Interestingly, this identification between Jesus and the Egyptian may somehow actually have traveled through history. Amulo, Bishop of Lyon in the ninth century, writes a book called Letter or Book Against the Jews to King Charles, where he states that the following is the name that the Jews give to Jesus. In their own language, they call him Usum Hamitsri, which is to say in Latin, Dissipator Egyptius. And in the Huldrich version of the polemical gospel Sefer Toldot Yeshu, Jesus' biological father is called the Egyptian because he did the work of the Egyptians. Another early source mentioning the claim that Jesus had arrived from Egypt was Christian author Arnobius of Sicca, who in his early 4th century work against the heathen writes, My opponent will perhaps meet me with many other slanderous and childish charges which are commonly urged. Jesus was a magician. He effected all these things by secret arts. From the shrines of the Egyptians, he stole the names of angels of might and the religious system of remote country. In other words, the idea that Jesus had a more than fleeting connection to Egypt was disseminated and discussed both among his adversaries and his followers in the first centuries of Christianity. Now let's go to an earlier messianic leader, John the Baptist. According to the New Testament, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus, the one who had baptized and initiated Jesus after the latter came down to the River Jordan, where John had gathered his flock and was preaching. John was, however, perceived as such a threat by Herod Antipas that the king ordered that his head would be severed and delivered to him on a plate. That this king would have the power to issue this order is somewhat puzzling since Herod Antipas was the ruler of Galilee and not of Judea where John the Baptist was active. So let us now go to the messianic leader Josephus calls the Egyptian. Did he also have a forerunner? Yes, he did. Or at least he had an important predecessor. The predecessor's name we have already heard, Theodos. Unlike John the Baptist and Jesus, these two messianic leaders seem to be a number of years apart. But Theodos is nevertheless the last messianic leader Josephus names before the Egyptian. And as a reminder, this is what Josephus writes about Theodos. Now it came to pass, while Fadus was procurator of Judea, that a certain magician 
whose name was Theodos, persuaded a great part of the people to follow him to the river Jordan, for he told them he was a prophet. However, fathers did not permit them to make any advantage of his wild attempt, but sent a troop of horsemen out against them. They also took Theodos alive and cut off his head and carried it to Jerusalem. Just as the Egyptian displays significant similarities with Jesus, albeit 20 years too late, so does Theodos display significant similarities with John the Baptist about 15 years too late. But Theodos is mentioned also in the New Testament, in Acts, presumably written by the same author as Luke. Acts thus managed to mention three of the major messianic rebel leaders of the first half century. But their presence in the New Testament is rarely noted because the names are just thrown into the narrative seemingly without context. This random dropping of names seems inexplicable, taken one by one. Taken together, they may form a pattern. Remember that Luke defines the time of Jesus' birth by the census under Quirinius. And this census is, according to Josephus, significant for only one reason. It marked the birth of the organized rebel movement under Judas the Galilean. Once again, the rebels seem to be present in the New Testament, especially in Luke and Acts, but only as a subtext. The century before the fall of Jerusalem was a time of intense scriptural interpretation. The writers of Pesharim, for instance, believed that scripture was written on two levels, one obvious, one concealed. Also, Jesus admonishes his disciples to look at the deeper level of his parables for the hidden story. It is perhaps not a far-fetched idea that also the narrative describing the life of Jesus, master of parables, would utilize this technique of writing on two levels, one obvious, one hidden. The New Testament by itself does not provide the reader with enough information to elucidate anything but the obvious story. Occasional oddities, such as the naming of rebel leaders, or Jesus instructing his disciples to buy swords, or talks of fire from heaven in a Samaritan village, remain unexplained. But when we put the accounts of Josephus next to the New Testament, certain similarities and perhaps underlying patterns of storytelling can be discerned. In conclusion, of all the historical events described in the Gospels, only one fits the description by Josephus chronologically as well as content-wise, namely the census under Quirinius. In Acts, there are a few more, but none of these occur before 44 CE. This stands in sharp contrast to what would materialize if we moved the gospel accounts 15 to 20 years forward. The number of matches would increase dramatically and they form a pattern with regard to the subject matter. The possible implications of this would, if the picture is true and representative, be significant. Unlike the majority view held among scholars, 
that Jesus was only a minor religious leader in his own time, one among many. Or the minority view, which says that Jesus was an entirely mythological character. The pattern in this graph could indicate something different entirely. Namely, that Jesus indeed was a prominent messianic leader, also in his own time, just as the New Testament says, only in a slightly different era. But the question, of course, is, if the time shift is true, why would anyone artificially want to move history from the 50s to the 30s? I would suggest that if this time shift is true, and if it is deliberate, there is only one likely reason to avoid competing accounts. It must be remembered that when these historical accounts were written, the nation which they portrayed had been destroyed and its people either killed or dispersed. The gospel writers wrote in exile after the destruction of Jerusalem. Thus, the risk of competing accounts was limited, but it was not negligible. Also, Josephus endeavored to rescue to posterity a history he feared would be lost. And there were other chroniclers of the turbulent decades preceding the Jewish war against Rome. It is worth pointing out that Josephus, the most important chronicler of the occupied Jewish realm, had defected to the Romans and had become a very prominent Roman intellectual. He may have been partially influenced by his new loyalties when he wrote his exceptionally harsh words on the Jewish messianic leaders and their followers. These unflattering depictions could have been reason enough for Luke, often thought to have read Josephus, or a later editor, to try to minimize the chances for competing accounts. Shifting the story of Jesus from Nazareth to a different time would have accomplished this, but at the cost of eliminating or at least greatly diminishing Jesus as a historical person. In essence, those who put together the Gospels may have wanted to dissociate themselves from the mostly negatively depicted violent political movements of the 50s. It was an insurrection triggered by many decades of oppression under foreign rule, an insurrection targeted primarily against the Romans, but also against the established Jewish leadership, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The scattered sprinkling of references to robbers and uprisings still found in the Gospels may be the remnants of parts of a story that could not be told, at least not overtly. <laughs>